also really thank all of you who were able to contribute. Uh, it, it appears we're sort of eyeballing it. It looks like there's a, a good lot of food there. And, um, and then a lot of these selected things, who were able to do this, selected things that um, I rarely see on the shelves at UCM. They're kind of higher end things. Like I noticed ready-made, easy-made macaroni and cheese. It's the kind of stuff that they just don't usually get. So um, before we do anything else, uh, I want to thank all of you. Give yourselves a round of applause. You did that. <laughs> shot across the battle of UCM and, um, and I, I sincerely appreciate all of you who were able to make a sacrifice with a tight budget and, and get this to happen. Um, the rest of you who might not have been able to do it this time, as you know, throughout the semester there are a lot of different ways that you're going to wind up helping. So I appreciate that help. You knew I had to do it. Okay, we're going to try that Latin phrase yet one more time. You've been in Western, you're college students. Can anyone at least tell me what it is? Great, I we do problems. Excellent, well done. Can anyone tell me what it means? This is better, yes, we're preparing for life. Thank you very much. This is great. This is great. Um, and so now, without any further ado, you know, we know the drill, you know what we're gonna do. Let's hear it. Odd. 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 Ramus. Excellent. We're getting there. This is so much better than last year. Um, I'm now going to get out of the way. We're going to move this, this band um, and let you meet uh, Lane, Lane Perry, who is uh, our Director of Service Learning at the University. And um, as you may have heard already, Service Learning at Western is, has been re uh, recognized nationally. We are uh, known as an engaged university. That's actually our, our, our Navy, one of our official classifications. And um, what will be very helpful for um, you listening to Dr. Perry and hearing how, how this operation works. We're doing this kind of service through this class now, but as I'm sure you'll hear, and as we've talked about on the, in the honors pathway before, that service learning really very likely will be an integral part of your portfolio when you graduate from Western. Somewhere down the road you're going to think, I'm this major and I want to connect service to what I'm doing in my major. And that's where um, Dr. Perry and the service learning um, program at Western really comes in. Uh, I was here a while back, a decade ago, and we didn't have it. And the difference that this program has made um, has been you know, incredibly significant. So without any further ado, I'm going to let Lane Perry take it. Thank you, Larry. Hey, thank you. Yes, Larry. That's awesome. Actually, my uh, football coach used that uh, moniker as a, as a way of uh, making fun of me sometimes. He'd call me Larry Perry. Get in there, Larry. So, it's awesome. Okay, guys. Um, I have a little video that I want to start with. Before we go into it, I want to give you a context. Can you all hear me back there? Or do you want me to stay by your mind? Can you hear me? Okay. Now we're getting ready to watch a video. Um, a little bit about me is I grew up in uh, Oklahoma, but then whenever I was 25 years old, I moved to Christchurch, New Zealand. And I spent five years there doing my PhD research at the University of Canterbury. And while I was there, there just happened to be an event that was literally heard around the world, and more importantly than being heard around the world, it was heard in my hometown, and it was an earthquake. 2010, September 4th, 7.1 earthquake devastated the city of Christchurch, New Zealand. Following that six months later, a small aftershock to the tune of a 6.3 located five kilometers deep under the middle of the city center leveled the city, killing 200 people, raising a number of buildings in its destruction. And New Zealand is the type of country, it's the type of place, we've heard of six degrees of Kevin Bacon, correct? Right? In New Zealand, it's two degrees. There's actually a phone company called Two Degrees, because if you don't know someone, you know someone who knows that someone. So when 200 people lost their lives, half of a mile from where I live, from an earthquake, from a natural disaster that then engaged with the built environment that human beings create, there was mass devastation in that community.
People pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, as would not be surprising. It's happened everywhere in every disaster. There's a book called Paradise Built in Hell. I highly recommend reading it if disaster and humanity and sociology interests you in any form or fashion, because it states the premise or the thesis that utopia is literally at the gates of hell. Standing in the midst of a disaster, you see the true humanity come to life within the people. That's sort of the premise. So the point of my talk today is that Focus on, you're here. Now what? You've heard it a number of times. You can be anything you want to be. Decide what to be and go be. And we all listen to the Avid Brothers. But what I want to do is go to another set of musicians that have spoken clearly to my heart as their local musicians from Christchurch who came together doing what they had and what they could with what resources they had access to. And I apologize if there's a weird uh, advertisement associated with this.
very New Zealand and in the video with the word anarchy. I don't know if you heard that or not. Okay, so you might be wondering why I started this out with a video of uh, music. Other than the fact that I really like music and I think that it can really capture metaphors and understanding moments in time in ways that other words cannot particularly those words for me. Like I said, it was Christchurch, New Zealand, 2010-2011. The community was in major strife. These folks, okay, there was thousands of volunteers that were out in the streets of Christchurch. Student Volunteer Army, I'll talk to you about that in one second. Out there organizing students like yourself to go out and be the difference they wanted to see in the community and to lend a hand where they could. Whether it was handing out a glass of water or it was moving silt through the process of liquefaction where this stuff bubbles up out of the ground, leaving an absolute mess behind and destroying houses and more importantly, lives. So, these folks said, look, we can go out there and we can move some seals around, we can pass out water and cupcakes, but we have a skill. We have a set of resources that we can use to be the change that we want to see in the problems in our community. This problem happened to be a little bit more blatant than some of the problems we have in our community now, but they're out there. This was an earthquake that literally woke us up um, metaphorically from our sleep, but then also very practically from our sleep. So, these musicians in the small town of Littleton, where the epicenter was located, came together to create the Harbor Union. And they used the skills that they had in order to be the change they wanted to see. Those skills were making music. So they had some audacious goals. Adam McGrath is one of my friends. He's actually come and played this at some of my classes that I taught at the University of Canterbury. He said, look, let's get this band of people together and form the Harbor Union Band. A bunch of musicians, around 10 of them, and each one of them submitted two songs to an album and they made 1,000 copies of a CD. And they sold it for 20 bucks a piece, because it was two CDs, there were quite a few songs on it. And they thought that they wouldn't have to do any more production around this album. They sold over 10,000 of these albums, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars for the community that they live in. And more importantly, the news media picked it up, and this song became the song, The Waterside, became the song that represented the pain of the earthquake. You can put a bed beneath my window, you can put a window inside my heart. You can put a heart inside this broken old chest. And you can put your head on my shoulder and rest. And there was nothing that was like a cool glass of water than hearing those words when we were in the middle of the storm that was in the aftermath of the earthquakes of Christchurch, New Zealand. And the point that I want you to take away from this particular story, we'll get to in a minute, but it was that they used their skills, they used the resources they had, they used what they were good at and what made their heart sing actually, and then also hypothetically, and then forward, speaking, what made their heart sing in order to be the change they wanted to see in the community, right? Pretty cool. What well, happened, um, their operation was quite a, quite a low budget operation, as you can imagine. They're not-for-profit, essentially, is how they became established after the first wave of CDs. So they had my students in my class come together, and we'll tell you what they bought us to make the process a little bit easier in New Zealand. Students tend to be able to drink at the age of 18, so they bought a few cases of beer. They're a band. And we had a number of students over to the house, and we packed 5,000 of their next wave of CD presses. And we had conversations around this, and this is the way that students were able to get involved in this particular movement. Speaking of students being involved in a movement, the earthquake, small aerial view here, just to help you see some of the devastation that happened in the city center the third most expensive earthquake in the history of our world. You probably didn't hear much about it, though, because it happened on the other side of the Earth, in the southern hemisphere. Yes, there is one of those, and it is a real place. And not only hobbits live there, real people do. <laughs> but speaking of hobbits and students in the other side of the world, there was another hobbit down there named Sam Johnson. Another one of my close buddies who, in the days following the earthquake, okay, this is one of those crazy stories, when you look back on people's great ideas of ingenuity and creativity and innovation, standing on this side of the idea, meaning you're getting ready to hatch it, it seems really profound and sort of earth-shattering. But standing on this side of the idea, it's a, duh, why didn't I think of that? Prime example in your own backyard. Who's heard of North Carolina State University? Sorry to mention them, but they are part of our family. Okay. Who's heard about um, the Red Zone campaign, trying to keep domestic violations to a minimum at the beginning of the school year and raise awareness around this, right? 
We've all heard about the Red Zone campaign. Did you hear about NC State's fingernail polish that they've organized? <laughs> Duh, what a great idea. I know there's a lot of controversy around it, like, oh, we're treating symptoms to a bigger problem. Don't care if it's keeping things from happening in a practical way, then it's a good idea by me. Let's deal with the bigger issue and raise awareness around it over time. It takes time to do that. Red zone campaign after red zone campaign, guys standing up when they see things they don't agree with, instead of being the silent bro on the side, being like, I don't agree with this, but I'm not saying anything. We'll get to standing up for things here in a second. Because my whole point here, and we'll get to some Sam Johnson, um, Hobbit Feller stuff in a second. If I can sell you on the why of something, if I can intrigue you with the why of community engagement and service, the how and the what will take care of itself. You're smart students, you know how to serve things, you know how to organize people, you know how to find information on the internet. My goal is to hopefully inspire you of the value of community engagement and service in your community. So, coming back full circle here, the NC State idea is one of those that are sort of like, duh, that's such an easy idea. Where the fingernail polish, for those of you who don't know, when girls or, or guys or whoever wears fingernail polish and they put their finger in their drink, it'll change color if there's something in that drink that shouldn't be. So the girl, of course, will then know I'm not going to drink this at this party because something bad might happen. So it empowers people in a lot of ways. And I also I understand there's another side of it and it's endorsing this sort of behavior and changing our society around it. But it's far easier to change your society around it than to be reactive than it is to completely and fundamentally change your culture around something. It takes a lot of time doing that. I'm not suggesting not to change cultures, but it takes a lot of time. And this is a really nice tool that, that ladies and, and men and people who, who want to use this tactic can keep in their back pocket or on their right hand, actually. So coming back here, Sam Johnson, the day after the earthquake, competing with some other folks on Facebook, started a simple Facebook page. Meet me at the corner of St. Albans and Waimari if you want to get involved in the community. If you want to be the change you want to see. If you want to lend a hand. Because what happened to that young man is he called up the Red Cross in the days following the earthquake and guess what they told him? Well, guess what they asked him? When he said, can I volunteer? What do you think he, they asked him? How old are you? What else? A little participation, you guys are better than me at this stuff. What do you think they asked him? What can you do? Yep. What can you do? What are your skills? He said, well, pretty good at burning couches while slightly intoxicated. <laughs> Something. Um, I'm a third year law student, worthless. Um, what can you do? They said, well, then you're probably better off hanging out in your bedroom and hiding under your bed and just not getting in the way. This didn't sit very well with them because the thing was, no one wanted to take on the mass that wound up being 2,200 volunteers within a month and within six months, 9,000 volunteers. No one wanted to take on that responsibility. So guess who did? Sam. Started a Facebook page. 10 students came out the first day, 30 the next day. They told their friends, their friends told their friends. And next thing you know, there's a couple hundred students coming out to get involved in service. Sam's now in charge of this huge organization growing right underneath him. It's this idea called spontaneous volunteerism. And I told you about the paradise built in hell, standing at the gates. People get involved. They want to lend a hand. They have this sort of survivor's remorse that comes with it, or unaffected or ineffective remorse that comes with these disasters. So they want to get involved. And who has more time than students when the university is closed? No one. Students had a ton of time to get involved in the community, but someone had to organize them. At the same time Sam Johnson started this one Facebook page, there were five other Let's Have Week-Long Vendor Facebook pages that popped up. Sam was the only one who started a volunteer-centered page. Again, standing on this side of it, scary. It's crazy to take that first step and know, knowing what's going to happen, the uncharted territory. Standing on this side of it, every one of us is like, geez, why didn't we do that? Number one most trusted person in New Zealand right now. He was asked to run for prime minister. He was asked to run for mayor of Christchurch. Seriously, the prime minister thing was kind of a joke. He's spoken at TED conferences. Sam Johnson, curly-headed third-year law student with no skills according to anyone whose opinion matters in the days following a disaster, started a Facebook page, managed 9,000 volunteers, cleared the Empire State Building worth of silt from people's homes, 
delivered meals, and did a substantial number of projects in the community to make it a better place. He's met Prince William. This guy has written his check for the future. And one of the coolest factors that I think that it's a really hard way to throw it out there because it makes it sound like it's something that should actually be considered. I don't think it is. It's one of my best buds. Sam Johnson's gay. So you can imagine that this was a factor in all of this as well when the news media was trying to think about how this can play out. New Zealand's quite a bit of a different country than us though, here in the United States. And he is an awesome young man who did some pretty radical things for that community. And he's inspired me in more ways than I can say. So what's the point in these stories? Why would I tell you these stories? Because I don't care who you list out to me in the name of people who you think are important humanitarians in our world. Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Sam Johnson, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, the list could go on, couldn't it? None of them started with the achievements for which they were known for. None of them started with the achievements for which they were known for. They just started. They started where they were, with what they had, and what they knew. And where they were when it came to the issue they chose to tackle was one of the scariest places they could be. Dealing with apartheid in South Africa as a black man, probably not a very easy task to take on. Civil rights in the United States, being at the cross centers as a 21-year-old in Christchurch, New Zealand in the days following the earthquake, really, it's pretty dangerous place to start. They started with what they had, which was virtually nothing, and what they knew was even less than what they had access to. But they didn't let it stop them. In fact, these are the types of people, probably like a lot of you sitting in this room right now, that are crazy enough to let that start them. They just started. They just pick up a string, and the more complex an issue you're getting ready to deal with, the better, because there's no wrong place to start. Just pick up a thread and go, because that will lead you to the next thread, and it will lead you to the next thread, and it's this very complex <coughs> weaving that involves weft and warp threads, and I don't want to get all crafty on you up here in Western North Carolina, but the point of the matter is you've got to start where you are with what you have, with what you know. And do not let that stop you. Do not let the fact that you don't know the 87 percentage point or decimal point that pi goes to. A lot of people feel like they have to have the um, oratory abilities of Martin Luther King Jr. They have to have the intellect of Einstein. They have to have the heart and empathy of Mother Teresa. And maybe once they've acquired those attributes, they can start embarking on change. False. No one started with the achievements for which they're known for. Things take hundreds of years sometimes, if not decades. It will take decades to achieve what you want to do. I can give you case after case after case. Mahatma Gandhi didn't even start his movement in India until he was 50. He spent 23 years in South Africa because he couldn't hack it as a lawyer after his family leveraged everything they owned to get him there because he stumbled over his words and wasn't a good orator. Gandhi, failure. Martin Luther King Jr. Applied for his first job over in Chattanooga at a little church. Failed. Didn't get the job. The job was based primarily on your ability to deliver a sermon. Seriously? Because you are not a finished product, you've got to start where you are with what you have and what you know. And I assure you that that today will be far less than that tomorrow. And then the next day. So how do you do it? How do you start where you are with what you have and what you know? Let's take a look. You have to stand up for what you believe in. The Velociraptor says that. <laughs> the Velociraptor, uh, a, cre a creature from the Cretaceous area, uh, area of, uh, no. the Velociraptor talks about standing up for what you believe in. And my point on this, and we'll ask you guys some questions here in a second, a little group interaction, is standing up for what you believe in. Has anyone ever stood up for what they believe in? stood up and said something? You know that moment right before you stand up and you've got like butterflies in your stomach? You're like, oh, this is that experience that Colin or Lane or Brian or my mom or my dad or my older brother was talking about, 
right? And you get sort of nervous, and that means that you're a real person, which is a, a nice barometer. Um, if you ever want to know if you're not a robot or not, forget Isaac Asimov's three rules. Just flirt with the idea of knowing yourself, and you'll get, you'll get butterflies. It's pretty crazy. Um, but the thing is, we all know that standing up for what you believe in is, is tough. Standing up is easy. Knowing what you believe in is the hardest part. Knowing what you believe in. So how do you determine what you believe? Anyone want to throw out some ideas on how you determine what you believe? Yeah. are bound by a lot of things. Bound by the families we grew up in, the religions that our family associated with, the towns we grew up in. Imagine growing up in, imagine being 15 years old in Ferguson right now. You guys know what I mean when I say Ferguson, right? This place over in Missouri where Michael Brown was shot by a cop, not the American now, black guy. That happened. Imagine growing up there. That's going to change your view on the world, right? And subsequently can lead to a change in beliefs. And I think that the reason why we know what it is that we believe is because a lot of times our beliefs are rooted in religion, right? It's not a bad thing. It's very cool. It really helps get the structure to this crazy thing we call the world. But the things I want to point out are things that you guys can handle right now. None of these three things. Experience, reflect, and conceptualize. You can go and have experiences. So people often ask me, how do you become an expert at something? Well, two ways. One, you have experiences dealing with that particular issue, and then you also read up on it and look at case studies and talk to experts in the particular field. I had a group of students come to me today in my class, and they were like, Lane, we're really struggling to come up with a cool idea of how to deal with poverty in Western North Carolina, because all your classes talk about innovation and creativity and cool stuff. And we don't want to do some sort of like old approach to dealing with this. We want to come up with something cool and innovative. And I'm like, oh man, I literally beat myself up for about 15 minutes. Like, oh, well, have you thought of this? What about that? And I was like, have you guys actually gone to the community table and served a meal yet? And they're like, no. And I'm like, I know that that's not innovative to you. Go down there. Go to the store and fill a bag through the Center for Service Learning's Fill the Bag program. Go rally up a bunch of food like you guys did, probably 600, 700 pounds worth of gear, feed three people, people for three days, and realize that that is a truckload of food that's going to feed people for three days. And feel sort of empowered and inspired, but at the same time feel a little bit deflated. Three days? It's 365 in a year. And you start thinking about it like that. I'm not taking away from it because I think that's amazing. But how do you keep things like that going all the time? And so I told them, you've got to go and have an experience with this stuff. You can read a hundred examples of how people have combated anger all over the world, but until you go and you deal with it yourself, firsthand, live below the line for a week. See how that leaves you feeling. It will leave you feeling tired. It will leave you feeling unhealthy when all you eat is ramen and bananas for a week straight. It has an impact on you. So the point is, in order to stand up for what you believe in, you need to truly determine what it is that you believe or what it is that you um, think is true about the world that we live in. Then you need to reflect on that experience. You need to stop and think about it and see what transferable lessons that might come from it. And you need to talk to people who've been there and done it before you. And then maybe start to become more educated on that topic, generally speaking. Start learning some statistics around the issue that you're dealing with. If you guys are looking at hunger through UCM, tackle it. Write a research paper on it. Write a position paper on poverty in Western North Carolina. Become educated on it so that you can ask educated questions. I didn't just say any one of those things. It's all three. It's all or nothing. You can't just go and do a bunch of stuff without stopping and thinking about it. Otherwise, you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. And the philosopher out there will eat you. <laughs> so it's important that you determine what your foundation is. And when I use this sort of metaphor, this idea of what is your earthquake? <coughs> We're getting here, guys. Stick with me for a minute longer. 
What is your earthquake? Okay, Sam Johnson's earthquake was an earthquake. So was Adam McGrath's. But there are earthquakes that exist within our community right now all the time, and you guys are grappling with one, a massive one in Western North Carolina as it relates to poverty. So what is your earthquake? Or what is your cause, to ask it in a more specific way and less cryptic? These are rhetorical questions for you to ponder on. And what do you care enough about to do something about in this world? And that does not have to be mutually exclusive to that of which you are studying. I hope when you walk across stage at Western Carolina University in three and a three-fourths more years, when you walk across stage, the vision you see standing on the other side of Chancellor Belcher handing you that diploma is you answering this question through the lens that you're choosing to adopt while at this institution. And by lens, I mean your disciplinary lens, nursing, mathematics, we have a new basket weaving major you might be interested in, your honor student in mind. <laughs> you want to do that one, but you could, you might double major in that one. The point is, I want you to walk across stage with your head held high, viewing the vision on the other side of Chancellor Belcher that is the answer to this question. What do you care enough about to do something about in this world? And more than knowing what it is, I want you to know how to do it. And that's why you're here at Western for another three and three fourths years. And finally, the final point I always like to end on when possible, find your bigger than. My senior year at the University of Central Oklahoma, this was the mission statement of our senior, of our UCOSA, our Student Government Association. Um, I somehow allowed us to be student body president then and haven't looked back since, but this was our mission that we established that year. And it's this idea to become a part, becoming a part of something bigger than you, but better because of you. Find your bigger than. And choose to identify what this is. Now, we've got a couple of minutes before we transition into the UCM. Um, folks who are going to be here to ask for a little bit of volunteer work from you all. Uh, but in the interim, we've again got three or four minutes. I want to see if you guys have any questions. I want to provide information to you about where the Center for Service Learning is located. And I didn't get into any of the practical stuff. If you want to know more about what the Center does, we have a website. Or you can ask me a question right now. We have cool things like alternative break trips. We have days of service virtually three weekends a month. We're going to be building a house with Ty Pennington and maybe get a hug or whatever. I'm going to love that dude. I'm going to love on him. I'm going to cuddle him so hard as the kids say these days. <laughs> no, but I will definitely won't be able to volunteer after that. I'm going to do it. Because um, they're rebuilding, they're turning a prison in Haywood County into a homeless shelter and a food pantry. Sweet, right? So that's happening. We have Mountain Heritage Day. There's tons of initiatives that we plan. And we also keep track of your service work through our center that you do with us through pre-approved programs like I just listed. And then we also have a process called the Independent Volunteer Project. That's independent. <laughs> independent Volunteer Project uh, process where you can get points from the reflections you do on the service. We don't give you points for your, for your service. We give you points for reflection. If you get 100 points, you get an extra piece of regalia to walk across stage in a few years, three and three fourths. Actually, now I think it's uh, less than that, so time's flying by. So that's a little bit about the practical stuff the center does, but what questions do you guys have before we hand it over to the UCM folks? It can be anything. It doesn't have to be about the center. Yes, I am married, and I do have a lovely daughter named Prescott. She's 17 months old. She's pretty cool. That means I'm human, right? I'm like, he's like, he's got dad, he's got to be down there. So. What questions? Don't start clapping because that means I have to leave. So, what questions? At least one question. That's always a rule of mine. Yes? What do you teach? I teach uh, in the leadership minor program. You guys heard of this one? Yeah. Yep. Teaching that. I teach a uh, social entrepreneurship course at the business college. Social entrepreneurship and how to change the world in the name of the book that you knew by David Bornstein. It's very cool. Um, and I also teach in the CSP program, which is a master's level course, um, master level program. And other courses as a side. I've taken students to Europe before, doing service work. We work with Syrian refugees in Munich. We do all sorts of crazy stuff as it relates to coursework on campus. Great question, though. Any questions?
Any other questions? One more. I need to have one more because I still got a couple minutes until they put their head in. Yes? What's the next service project? The next service project, we have the 9-11 day of service. You guys are actually the first generation, and I'm not going into the bus with the statement, you're the first generation to be so young when 9-11 happened that you probably don't remember where you were unless you were just like a genius four-year-old. Um, or you're a non-traditional student who's transferred in when you're part of the honors college. You were at school? Yeah, I was at school. Okay, 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 okay. You remember, so obviously it's important to you guys. My point is, the next year, they will be, we're right on the cusp right here. You guys are the next generation. You're not millennials. You're Generation Z, according to most research right now. So we're really on the cusp, because I'm the young, I'm the oldest millennial, and you guys might be the youngest millennials. Some of you. Some of you are on the other side of being Generation Z, so there's this really interesting uh, transition we're going to be going through for the next couple of years with our incoming classes. But 9-11 Day of Service is on Saturday the 12th, sorry, the 13th, I'm bad, next week, next Saturday. Then Ty Pennington's build the 25th. Be watching your mic cap. We're going to be sending this email out to all of you. You can register right through it. There's going to be over 1,000 volunteers that day. It's going to be wild. We're going to have shovels running back and forth all day for four-hour increments because you're going to be doing four-hour service projects typically. Uh, and then also Mountain Heritage Day is a really excellent opportunity, perhaps the best concentrated opportunity for you to learn about the region where you live. I came from Oklahoma, and I understand what it is to respect a region that to most people is boring. And then when you live there, you understand the rich culture and the rich heritage that exists under the ground, literally and figuratively. And you're in a place right now where that's all true. There's a lot of really cool history and stuff going on. Any other questions? That's for the month of September. We're also going to Charleston, South Carolina for fall break. That's out right now. There's only about five spots left on that bad boy. We're going to be doing about 30 hours of service work over there and about 30 hours of fun stuff. Yeah, I would love to see some form of activism happen on this campus. Right now, we've got a major thing going on. How many of you are registered to vote? Cool, that's great. How many are registered to vote here in Jackson County so you don't have to go back home or do an absentee ballot? Okay, you can re-register here and it won't mess anything up in your life. Like, I mean, it won't, like, it won't be taken off your parents' taxes, even though that was something the North Carolina State Government tried to pass behind all of these backs, where you would be law all. Think about it, why would they want to do it? Because college students are bastions of, you thought I was like, <laughs> bastions of liberal, Ness, located in pockets of red Ness. So a lot of folks in the government want to, short, want to sort of shift these things, right? To where if you were to relocate here and vote here, your parents can no longer claim you on their taxes and you lose your health insurance. Bummer, dudes. Luckily, a bunch of parents came together as activists and stymied this, kept it from happening. So that's enough. I know that, is, is someone out there calling who's going to be, or someone in here who's popping up? I've already jumped in my time. I was just going to keep rapping in April for as long as you need me to. Yeah, uh, we'll see you. Oh, cool. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Good. Charlotte and Durham, which is where Raleigh is. 
So the poverty level here is lower than the major cities where you consider, like where you think of a bunch of people living in poverty. So you can kind of tell that we're um, in a crisis. And even though we didn't have an earthquake, there's still a lot of needs here. Um, so we're going to give you the opportunity to get started on some of those things that Dr. Perry was talking about. Finding your thing that's bigger than you. Maybe volunteering is that thing, but you don't know until you try it, right? So we're going to give you the opportunity. A couple of you have some papers um, that have information on them. It says you see a volunteer sign up sheets. Um, I don't know if you got one, if you have extras passing around. Um, and if you're not, if you can't, um, if you're already looked over it and you can't do any of the hours, pass it to someone who seems to be interested. But basically, United Nations Ministries is like a giant food pantry. Um, people come in and they um, talk to the directors, the counselors there, and they get food, they get household items, they get personal items, and all of that stuff that you raise, that's going to United Christian Ministries. But um, once it gets there, somebody has to do something with it. It has to be put on shelves, it has to be sorted, all that kind of stuff. So that's where we need y'all's help. Um, and so if you are interested in any way, please get this back to me. I'll be hanging out. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, like I said, just fill it out. We're going to have an interest meeting on Thursday, September 18th, right after the, um, the USI meeting. So if you're, like I said, if you're interested in any form, please attend that meeting. Um, and you can get credit for it. So that's totally awesome, right? Um, it also looks really good on transcripts and um, resumes and all that stuff. So for those of you who are really, really excited about volunteering, it does look good on professional things as well. So, um, like I said, if anybody has any questions, please just let me know. Is anybody burning to ask me something right now? Yeah, uh, where are all the papers? You need to get one. Um, if anybody has a paper, like I said, we can print more copies. I just didn't, I don't know if this is going to the group. So, um, if you need a copy, if you are interested, Thank you. 